Stats of Advent of Code show that the hardest problem was on day 20, Jurassic Jigsaw. A lot of people dropped when compared to the previous day, a lot of people solved just an easier version of a problem to get a silver star. It was just a hard problem. I will show you my solution, the visualization of the algorithm, and we'll do code walkthrough. We are given multiple tiles of size 10 by 10, filled with dots and hashes, and we need to assemble them into one big grid. This is an example of nine tiles correctly arranged into a 3x3 three three grid. Tiles are colored for clarity. Two tiles can be next to each other only if they match exactly on their border. Here, those two columns must be exactly the same. Hash hash, dot dot, hash hash, and so on. You can look here at any two adjacent tiles, like those two, or these two, and they will match exactly. But not only you should decide where to put every tile, but also how to rotate and flip them, because this is allowed in the problem. For any object, if you are allowed to rotate by 90 degrees, you will have four possibilities of how it will look like, and if you can also flip, that's eight possibilities in total. In easy version of a problem, we don't need to find the full grid, we just need to find the product of IDs of corners, the four corners of the grid, the four tiles to put there, and fortunately it was guaranteed that for every tile it will match with borders uh, the four neighbors in the final grid, but it cannot match anything else. It's not that some other tile is here and its bottom column matches, its bottom row matches exactly my top row. It cannot happen, so I can, instead of arranging stuff into a grid, I can just compute the degree of every tile. For every tile, try every other tile, see if they match each other after proper rotations, compute the degree. If something is in the middle, the degree will be 4. If it's on the border, it's 3. And finally, if something is in the corner, the degree is 2. On the left is some easy pseudocode for that. You just need to be able to rotate and flip tiles. Nothing interesting compared to the full problem. We will now use backtracking, and if you don't know it, I recommend this easier problem and queens on lead code. And if you want something more advanced, then here's grid paths on CSES. Links are in the description. Even in this small example of just nine tiles, there are nine factorial ways to arrange them and also rotate and flip them. That's eight for each of them, so eight to ninth power. And this is already huge. And actually the test you download from the website, it has more than a hundred tiles, not just nine. So this is really impossible to run. But after you put two tiles, next to each other, you can already check if they match with borders, and if not, then don't try further. And this method of breaking whenever possible from, let's say, recursion is called backtracking. Let's see what happens here. I try every tile here, and it's every rotation, like one, maybe one like that. Then I try to put something here. I try every other tile as long as it matches with the border properly say id3, then I try something here, there, and so on. You can do it in any order, I did it row by row. You might say, okay, what's the new complexity? It's very hard to say. You almost never can give a proper small upper bound for complexity uh, with backtracking, but when we run this, for the sample test of nine tiles, we just get, we just get 37 recursive calls, at least my code does, so it's just very low. And we can keep improving it with various heuristics, like saying after we put this one and three, we can already kind of predict in the future what can be next to one, what can be next to three, and can they match each other with borders. But this is more advanced and we didn't really need that in this advent of code problem. Here's a quick visualization before we jump to code. The algorithm tries every possible top left corner, including different rotations, and then does the rest of the grid row by row. Eventually it finds the full grid, prints it, and we'll later see this visualization for the full test with more than a hundred tiles. The code isn't that scary, it's around hundred lines. First we have boring stuff, rotate two-dimensional array of characters, and then flip. This is very easy, like reversing a string. Let's hide this. I have a struct or class for a tile. We have helper functions whether two tiles can be next to each other or one above the other. Again, let's hide. The main function is search. This is a recursive function that does the backtracking. In, mail, in main, I read the input, also try all eight rotations and flips of a tile, and I gather them to some global vector. Yeah, these tiles, it contains eight times n available tiles. n is the number of tiles in the input, 
and each of them has eight possible versions. But each of them has the same ID, so I will not try to use the first style like this and then rotate it. <laughs> Sorry. And then rotate it next to it because they have the same ID and this ID will already be taken. And after creating an empty set of visited or already used tiles, tile IDs, I run search starting from 0, 0 and given this set. The grid has some size and in the search function row column they refer to position in the full grid like this one would be 1, 2 because it's row 1, column 2 counting from 0 and this would mean that those tiles are already chosen and I can refer to them to check when choosing a new tile to put here I will check the top neighbor and the left neighbor. Right? Let's see the code. Uh, this we'll talk about later. For every tile, if this ID is not yet visited, then try to put it here. And I check this in the previous row. Can you be above me in the left column from me? Can you be on the left from me? Uh, if yes, then continue and let's try. I mean, if there is not a possible match, then we continue and we try another tile. But if everything is all right and those are proper neighbors, then we say that on this position, row column, we put this tile, we mark it as visited, and we go to the next uh, cell on the right. So usually we go to row, comma, column plus one, unless this is the last column, grid size minus one, then we go to the next row. And uh, after doing this recursively, of course, we need to erase from the set of visited IDs. And finally, when we get to uh, the last row, the one after the last one, then we found the proper solution and we print the product of IDs of four corners and we exit. The actual number of tiles we are given is more than a hundred and this might be overwhelming for any exponential solution, but backtracking is faster than you would think, especially if there are some conditions guaranteed like only a few possible neighbors. And you might be worried that here my program takes a lot of time because it tries, then it tries again, it tries again. But actually I make my program sleep for like 30 milliseconds after printing any grid because otherwise it would be too fast for us to see. Uh, my program without printing and sleeping, it just takes 30 milliseconds to solve this whole test. But for maybe some other more malicious tests where more, you know, puzzle pieces fit each other, it would take much more time. Also, I will tell you that in the full problem, we need to, as an extra, it is the second part of the problem, uh, we need to remove frames of every tile. So instead of 10 by 10, it will be 8 by 8. Oh, we got 2000 recursive calls instead of really billions of billions of billions if you don't do any breaks from uh, the recursive function. So if you make it really naive, brute force instead of backtracking. Also, here's the real time, yeah, 30 milliseconds to solve the problem. Uh, in the full problem, we need to remove those frames of every tile, like this thing, this thing. So we don't want to care anymore about this part that was given for us only to say which pieces match each other. And we only look at the internal parts and we need to find some shapes. The shape is actually a sea monster. It looks like that. And for every hash here, we need to have a hash in our grid. We need to say not really how many monsters there are, but, but like how many cells there are that are not part of a monster or something like that. Doesn't matter too much. So two extra functions, remove frames. I just took it from my print function that I already created before. We've ex as an extra, we skip a row if it's first or, or last row of a tile. We skip a column if it's first or last column of a tile. Everything else we put into a vector of string, so basically a two-dimensional array of characters. Every uh, every tile should give you eight by eight, and we run more complicated function find monsters. But still, it's just finding a pattern. Like in one dimension, in a string, you can check every substring of some length to see if it's exactly the equal to the pattern. The same is easy in two dimensions. You just try every top left corner of a grid. And if you see, if starting from here, this pattern is there. The complexity becomes, you know, height times width multiplied by height times width of a pattern, but it's all very small. So it will be actually faster than the backtracking part. And they told us in the statement that we need to flip and rotate 
to check for different kind of monsters. Actually, we don't. So you see some commented out part. Yeah. And this is how everything looks like for first the small test. We have two sea monsters. And for the big test, it's like this. There are quite a few of them, but all of them are arranged like from left to right without any flips and rotations. So that was convenient. I expected actually that some of them might intersect and I wasn't sure how to count them, but yeah, the test was easy and not ambiguous. I don't know how to do complicated animations, but Phil Gold on YouTube can, so check out his video on more interesting animations. And I think that his solution is overcomplicated because he doesn't put stuff row by row, one by one, but it's just cool to look at. Check out that video, see all my codes in GitHub repository, link is in the description. Thank you all for watching. Tell me if you want any other problem, like maybe day 13, it was about Chinese remainder theorem. If you want, I can make a lecture or a video about that. All right, thanks for watching, bye bye.